Ooh, baby, it's cold. <laughs> but I'm out here to give you guys a little tour. Uh, you know, we're actually here in uh, Lower Manhattan. We're gonna be doing a little walk here, showing you some of the dark side of this area, this neighborhood. Um, yeah, I did a tour here. I did a little walk in this area already. Uh, so you should check that out, you know. But uh, today we're gonna be covering some stories you may not know, some of the stuff that is more macabre, if you will. And uh, it's pretty empty today. We're getting here in the morning when it's still pretty chilly. Uh, oh, before we start, real quick, please check out the Patreon. Come on, the Patreon. That's what helps fund these things. That, that's what helps keep, keep me from having to, you know, hawk skin creams and, uh, you know, yoga pants on these videos. So that's a big help. And, uh, you know, just here's a link in the description. Also, too, just like the video. Give it a thumbs up. That's the least you can do. Uh, and also subscribe, it's a big one too. Very easy, come on, you're gonna get more of these things. That's all the biz, as the kids say. Uh, I guess we'll get started here in a second. Eric, how you doing? It's good to see you again. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, you too, I'm still warm, things are good. Nice, I was uh, giving a lot of thanks over Thanksgiving for having you as a camera guy. Oh good, none you told me about. All right, well, sorry about that. Uh, it was there though, uh, the sentiment was there. But that being said, uh, we're gonna get started here uh, in a second in front of the stock exchange on Wall Street here in Lower Manhattan. And we're gonna get started walking to our first stop, which is very close. Um, I don't know, I guess I could just ramble a little longer uh, and freeze my uh, stones off. But uh, I don't know, I think we should just go. What do you think, Eric? Let's do this, huh? Let's do it. All right, well, we're here at our first stop. This is actually 23 Broad Street. This is the site of what used to be the JP Morgan headquarters. And I'm actually here on the northern wall to point out uh, a little stop. You can see there in the little wall, there are some pock marks. These pock marks were left here purposely, but they are there because on September 16, 1920, at approximately noon, middle of the lunch day on a weekday, uh, there was an explosion right here. Hundreds of pounds of explosions were detonated here uh, in the middle of lunch hour. All these people walking around and stuff, uh, like 38 people were killed, hundreds were injured. Uh, you can imagine with all the bankers and stuff in this neighborhood, the streets were littered with, you know, Cole uh, Haan shoes and Patagonia vests. And, uh, you know, a lot of people died. It was, uh, in fact, William Joyce, one of the clerks at uh, JP Morgan, because this was JP Morgan headquarters, uh, he died, he had just gotten married, he, was, he had skipped on his honeymoon, he pushed his honeymoon back to work uh, during this time. Junius Morgan, uh, J.P. Morgan's son was actually injured in the attack, uh, poor little June bug, but it all happened right here, and believe it or not, they never actually found who did it. Uh, this case was opened until 1940, and they never found who did it. They believe it was Italian anarchists. Now, also just so you know, in the early 1900s, there was a big problem with anarchists and communists. Remember, the Russian Revolution only happened in uh, 1917. So the whole idea of communism and all this stuff was pretty new, uh, and it was kind of still being fleshed out. But the immigrants were the ones that people were scared were bringing it over. It was Italians, uh, the Eastern European and Russian Jews. So uh, that was one of the big issues of people going through Ellis Island, for example, uh, is whether or not they were anarchists, whether or not they were uh, communist, all that stuff. In fact, Emma Goldman was uh, deported uh, in, I believe, 1919 uh, because of uh, her anarchist beliefs. And one of her ex-lovers was the man who tried to kill and assassinate Henry Clay Frick, who has the Frick Mansion up in the Upper East Side. Uh, and she, she was, uh, was kind of dating him. You know? those, uh, those assassins can be pretty dreamy, I guess. Alexander Berkman. Uh, so all this was going on. In fact, William McKinley in 1901 was killed by an anarchist. Uh, he was assassinated, the president. Uh, so it was, a big, it was a big issue at the time. And in 1920, September 16, 1920, a bomb was detonated right here in the middle of Wall Street. It was one of the biggest terrorist attacks uh, in New York history. Uh, so it all happened right here. And then, then the pockmarks were left here on purpose. So in fact, right after the bomb exploded, the next day, they made it a point to clean everything up, have everything ready to go, and have the next workday just happen as if, as if nothing occurred the, the previous day. They did that on purpose. And these, these pockmarks were left by the J.P. Morgan company to show everybody that it was gonna take a little more than just a, a bomb to stop them from doing business, which is uh, pretty cool. I mean, J.P. Morgan was kind of an asshole back then, uh, but uh, you know, he was a pretty powerful guy and kind of arrogant, but uh, you know, interesting, interesting dude nonetheless. Um, I've had some friends I know work at J.P. Morgan there. Some of them are kind of assholes too. They like to say the phrase models and bottles a lot. I know that, uh, but you know, 
I don't know, I guess there's something. Like when you're going out, like, what are you doing tonight? Models and bottles, bro. You're gonna get bottles at a club and then uh, hang out with models. You never heard that before? No. Well, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry this had to be your first time. What's that? It tells you the circles I travel in. Yeah, it tells you the circles I travel in, more like it. Uh, anyways, uh, that's it. This is pretty cool, though, no? It is. Pretty cool, cool. little pockmarks there. 1920. Serious business. Serious business, baby. All right, let's go to our next spot. <laughs> All right, so I'm here at the corner of Wall Street and Water Street, just hanging, totally loose, totally chill. But uh, behind me is a marker to something that most people don't know even existed here. Uh, this is a marker indicating the New York's municipal slave market that was located right here in this area. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, New York, as liberal of a city and as diverse of a city as it is, was a very important slaveholding city. Uh, for a very long time. Slavery wasn't abolished here until 1827, which is pretty late. Uh, in fact, by the time this market was finished, uh, it's like one in six people in the, the, in the city were uh, slaves. Slaves built Wall Street. They built the wall that was located on Wall Street. Ah, I don't know if you knew that, but Wall Street had a wall on it. Um, and also, by 1730, 40%, over 40% of New York households had a slave. Uh, the only other uh, city in the colonies at the time that even compared was Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, that Charleston. So it was, a big, it was a big deal here in New York. And in 1711, they opened this slave market right here because uh, owners of slaves were starting to get concerned because when slaves ran out of work or there wasn't enough work for them, they had idle time on their hands. And it was actually up to them to go around and find work for, uh, for them and then also give the money, and the money would go to the owner of the slave, which is kind of crazy. So they, they pushed for this market to be open to keep these slaves busy and keep them working. And it was these slave markets that were the most feared among slaves, actually. They were more afraid of the markets than they were of, of you know, getting flogged or whipped because this is what tore families apart. Uh, you know, you'd, never, you'd literally never see your, your father or your mother, or your sister or daughter again uh, once they were sold at these slave markets. This slave market was actually open until 1762, uh, right here in this spot, uh, which is crazy. And New York, even after slavery was abolished, benefited a lot from slavery. In fact, uh, AIG, Aetna, uh, New York Life, these insurance companies insured, uh, insured them. Also too, companies like, you know, uh, Domino Sugar used sugar that was, you know, ha harvested in, by slave labor. Uh, Domino Sugar, by the way, a little trivia, they invented the sugar packet. A little sugar packet. All right, I digress. Also, too, Brooks Brothers. They took, Brooks Brothers, which started here in New York, they used cotton that was, that was harvested by uh, slaves in the South. Uh, and to add insult to injury, Brooks Brothers clothes look like this. So, uh, yeah. Anyways, all that happened here in New York. New York was always a big, uh, very important uh, city for slavery. And then after slavery, uh, was kind of torn on the issue of slavery during the Civil War because of how much it benefited from. The banks here all benefited from slavery. So a uh, very contentious issue here in New York, even though New York has a very liberal uh, uh, reputation. If you want to learn more about that, I actually have an interesting little video on slavery and racism in New York City. You should check it out. A little uh, plug there. OK, anyways. Uh, it's this spot right here, pretty cool. So you could be walking down the street eating your, your Dunkaroos or whatever, whatever you kids eat these days and uh, you wouldn't even know this was here. But very important history to know here in New York. A little dark, but uh, you know, that's what we're here for, to talk about this stuff. So what do you think, Eric? Should we go to the next spot? Let's do it. All right, so I'm here at our next stop. We're at the corner of Pearl and Broad Street, which is the site of Franz's Tavern. Ah! Oh, Franz's Tavern, very nice. Uh, actually, there's been a tavern here since the mid-1700s, named after Samuel Francis, who actually owned the land back then. Uh, this building, however, dates back to the early 1900s. It's a recreation. Uh, but, you know, famous also for backing out of a video that they were supposed to do with me in an interview and tour. Last second, I showed up with my camera person, and they said, you know, take a hike. And I was like, all right, great. Uh, I'm not bitter, <laughs> but actually more importantly, um, this was the site of our next event, uh, which happened on January 24th, 1975. This was the site of a bombing, actually. They, they brought a bomb, they put it right there near the entrance to the restaurant, and it was detonated around 1.29 uh, p.m. 
uh, on the day. It was a weekday. People were here eating lunch. Uh, four people were killed. Forty people were injured. Uh, they had to bring a cherry picker, a little motorized uh, ladder. Uh, to evacuate people from the second and third floors. It's a pretty benign name for the ladder used to evacuate people burning to death. But uh, yeah, all of that happened here. Um, and the people who were responsible for it claimed responsibility by sending the AP a message to the Associated Press, and it was the Fuerzas Armadas de Liberación Nacional Puerto Riqueña. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's a pretty exotic sounding name for such a brutal terrorist organization, but they were actually responsible for uh, over 100 bombings from the mid-70s to the mid-80s, and they were seeking uh, independence for Puerto Rico. Uh, in fact, in the late 90s, uh, uh, I think 16 of their members were granted clemency, and uh, one of them actually rejected it and stayed in jail till, the, till like 2017 or something, uh, and he was recently released, but a very controversial group um, that did a lot of bombings and stuff, but they were the ones who took responsibility for this one. Uh, this building is also famous for, you know, people like uh, George Washington had his farewell dinner here after the Revolutionary War uh, on the second floor. He bid farewell to all his officers and things. I'm sure they didn't cancel on him last second. Uh, but it's a really cool uh, little bar. You know, you can come here for you know, kind of overpriced food, but, uh, you know, they have live music and stuff on the weekends. You know, you can come here, someone play guitar. I'm sure they play the song, you know, uh, Wonderwall and, and uh, Wagon Wheel. You know, they got that song. Like, uh, a very period specific music. Uh, well, rock me, mama, like a wagon wheel. Rock me, mama, any way you feel. Hey, mama, rock me. That was pretty good, right? Sorry, that was, uh, that was, uh, I was taking time away from everybody's lives uh, by singing that. But yeah, it's all here. Pretty cool little place. Uh, Side of a bombing. January 21st, I'm uh, 24th, sorry, uh, 1975. Uh, the moral of the story is, uh, you know, don't ever cancel uh, an appointment with Tom D, baby. Or your, or your restaurant will get, yeah, or your restaurant will get bombed. Is that a threat? Does that sound like a threat? Is that too dark? All right, let me get the hell out of here. Man, I'm out of here freezing at our next spot. I'm at the corner of West Broadway and Chambers at the 123 subway stop. And it was here that on December 22nd, 1984, a subway train was speeding down from 14th Street carrying a man named Bernard Getz. He was on the subway train carrying a concealed 38 caliber revolver uh, waiting for someone to mug him. And, a, and, and four kids, four black teenagers actually walked up to him. One asked him if he had $5 and he shot him and shot his three friends. And then one of his friends who was on the ground, he looked down at him and he said, you don't look so bad and he fired another shot uh, and paralyzing him actually. This man became known as the subway vigilante because around that time in New York, everyone was getting mugged. People were tired of it. It was super dangerous. Going down to the subway meant you were gonna get mugged. People were, everyone was used to being mugged. In fact, Bernard Getz had been mugged before in 1981, which prompted him to buy that gun. Anyways, he escapes that day on the 22nd. He flees, he goes to Vermont where he buries the gun and then he turns himself in in Concord, New Hampshire on the 31st of December. He's brought back to New York and he divides the city. Everyone takes a side on this case. Everyone talked about this case for the entire year, pretty much. Uh, you had one side believed this guy had had enough. Everyone was tired of getting mugged. Everyone was tired of feeling uh, under threat in their own city. So they kind of took his side. But then you had the other side, led by people like Al Sharpton, actually, who were saying that you can't just let everyone on the loose and you know become a vigilante. He also would said things like, you know, if, if those teenagers had been white and the shooter had been black, would it have been the same story? So it was a big issue that kind of happened right here at this subway stop uh, for the, the two train, uh, the deuce. Uh, and in fact, when he shot all these people on the, on the subway car, you can imagine what seeing this must have been like. It must have scarred everyone on that car. Uh, everyone in the other cars must have been really pissed because they were gonna be late to where they were going. But it was a really uh, big deal. You know, it was, a, it was a very dangerous city at the time. Uh, so he ended up getting acquitted in 1987 uh, of the eventual trial of the murder and manslaughter charges, but he actually did have to go to jail for having an illegal firearm. Uh, uh, but in 1996, he actually lost a civil suit to the Cabby family. Daryl Cabby was a kid who uh, ended up paralyzed. Uh, he lost a civil suit. So now he owes uh, $43 million. You know, not a, not a small chunk of change, but those kids that actually had sharpened uh, uh, screwdrivers in their, in their jackets as well, and uh, so they were probably up to no good that day. Uh, it, it's up, up in the air as to whether they were actually gonna rob him. They claim they weren't. He claims that they had the gleam in their eye. 
Uh, this is also around the time, a few years after the movie Death Wish, starring Charles Bronson came out, where Charles Bronson actually carry like a gun in the subway, and he actually would do the same thing. He'd just shoot people who would come up to him and things like that. So it was a really kind of crazy case, one of the more famous uh, shootings in New York history, and it happened right here. Uh, well, he actually escaped right here. It was on the subway train. Uh, but yeah, kind of crazy. In fact, one time we, uh, someone tried to come up and, and steal the camera while I was shooting one of these things, believe it or not, when I was in Queens. Uh, but the guy was so drunk that I was just kind of like, dude, get out of here. And he eventually uh, kind of left. But he, was, he started to kind of grab the camera. I took the arm off the camera and just said for him to leave, you know. Kind of nuts. You never know what's going to happen out here. But uh, I guess everyone in New York's got a story like that. So this is it. The, the, uh, the two trains stop here at Chambers in Lower Manhattan. Uh, you know, I ain't no subway vigilante, but no one's going to steal this camera. Right? Right, Eric? Let's hope. Yeah, let's hope. I shouldn't say that too loud. All right. Well, anyways, it's a story of the subway vigilante. Pretty, uh, pretty crazy thing that happened here in New York in 1984. All right. Let's move on to the next spot. All right, we're here at uh, our penultimate stop. Uh, how's that for an SAT word, huh? Penultimate. Anyways, we are here at the, well, unfortunately we're kind of covered. Uh, they put a damn dumpster right in front of what I wanted to talk about, which shows you how much respect people have for history here. Uh, but it's right there, you can see it. This is called the Sugar House Prison Window. This is actually a piece of what was a sugar house back in the 1700s. Unfortunately, that sugar house, well, that sugar house was located right here on Duane and Rose Streets, uh, right near City Hall, but it was demolished in 1892 and it was replaced by the Rylander Building, which was then demolished in 1968. And this piece of all those buildings was actually moved and it's now located here right next to the Brooklyn Bridge, right next to one of my favorite buildings as well, the Municipal Building, a very pretty uh, Booza building right here uh, in uh, Lower Manhattan. But what it is and its significance is the prisons that were located here during the Revolutionary War. So there were a bunch of sugar houses here uh, throughout the 1700s because sugar was brought from the Caribbean. It was processed here, stored in uh, these sugar houses, processed by families that owned these, like the Van Cortlands, the Roosevelt's, huh? very famous names there. But people uh, forget that a lot of people that died during the Revolutionary War died in these prisons. In fact, I covered uh, the Prison Ship Martyrs Monument in Fort Greene in my Fort Greene video. Yeah. But uh, they also stored them in uh, sugar houses. Not only did they store them in uh, prison ships in places like uh, the Brooklyn, what is today the Brooklyn Navy Yard, they also stored them and kept them in uh, the sugar houses. And these were awful conditions, man. Like, the, you, know, you know, people were being flogged. They died of things like dysentery, uh, you know, typhus, uh, uh, smallpox. Uh, this, you know, these weren't prisons like, this isn't Shawshank Redemption, okay? It wasn't, it wasn't, there was no Morgan Freeman walking around listening to opera music. This was like people, you know, dying. There was like, uh, in fact, there was a boat, the, the Jersey, which was one of the ships, actually. There were six to eight deaths a day on that ship, they were saying. Uh, and so it was a really, really terrible condition. So they kept this uh, little, I guess, uh, memorial here to the people who, uh, you know, suffered in these, uh, you know, prison houses, the, the sugar houses. And uh, there are also the prison ships around the time because this was the headquarters of the British during the uh, during the Revolutionary War. Ah, New York City was the was the uh, was the headquarters uh, until 1783 when George Washington came back in here triumphantly and took it back for the Americans. Uh, but anyways, I, this kind of sucks. We're next to a dumpster, but uh, you know it's right there in case you ever want to come here. It's uh, you know pretty cool. All right. Some people don't respect history. Anyways, uh, let's get to the end of this video. See you there. All right, so it brings us to our last stop. We're gonna end the video. Uh, actually, behind me is Police Plaza here. This is where the, basically the police headquarters, NYPD headquarters is located. You've probably seen it on like, you know, Law and Order a billion times, all that stuff. But here to my left, is where the Metropolitan Correctional Center is, where in, uh, on August 10, 2019, uh, Jeffrey Epstein hanged himself. Hanged himself, right? Uh, this all happened, he was actually arrested July 6, 2019. He was flying in New Jersey from Paris. Uh, they surprised him, were able to arrest him. Uh, he wasn't able to get bail, all that stuff. He actually tried to kill himself once on the 23rd of July. They put him on suicide watch, and then just mysteriously, he was able to commit suicide on August 10th. 
Uh, interestingly enough, they just recently released some records and stuff. They had been taking down exactly what he was doing for like every 15 minutes leading up to his, uh, his death, but just uh, randomly he wasn't able to you know, be stopped from uh, hanging himself uh, on August 10th. In fact, like he was giving people investment advice, uh, you know, other inmates. Can you imagine like coming out of your, your being held as a prisoner and you come out and you're like, hey, honey, we should really invest stock in a GE. And she's like, oh yeah, what do you make you think that? He's like, oh yeah, some pedophile in jail told me that. I don't know. You're not quite what he's accustomed to, very rich guy. Uh, his, uh, you know, lodgings and things in uh, the Upper East Side and on his, you know, pedophile island in the Caribbean and all that stuff. But uh, this is where it all ended for him. And now, in fact, currently, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell is being tried here in New York City. And uh, they actually gave her uh, paper clothes so she can't attempt to kill herself uh, the way he did. A little dark, yeah, I know, but, uh, you know, thought I'd show this to you. And, uh, you know, there's a cool view there of Lower Manhattan, which is where we just were. Uh, someone was just running there. I hope <laughs> we're not running away from... Ghislaine Maxwell or something, but uh, anyways, this is where the, the video ends. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. This is the dark side of Lower Manhattan. Before we end, guys, completely check out the Patreon, baby. That's what helps keep these nice, crisp, and polished uh, shots with me and Eric. Eric, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. But uh, yeah, check out the Patreon. Big help. Also, too, please just subscribe and like the video. That's a big help, too. Trying to grow this thing, baby. See where it goes. And, uh, you know, that was kind of a, you know, more along the lines of our, you know, uh, dark look into New York City and all the, the creepier stuff going on here, which is kind of interesting, you know. Uh, did I miss anything, Eric? Uh, we'll have to take a dark look into the comments to find out. Yeah, let's, let, well, there's nothing darker in the world than uh, YouTube comment section, uh, so... Uh, yeah, maybe we'll do a video on the YouTube comments section one day. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. We're here on Park Row from Metropolitan Correctional uh, Center. We went down to Lower Manhattan. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'll see y'all later.